<coughs> right, I'm going to hand over to Melanie. Right, and um, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for joining us in the next in our primary care webinar series. Um, I know some people uh, joined us in the first ones that we did in August. Um, I'm just going to run through a couple of slides, so if you can click on to the next one, Mike. Fabulous. So this is just a little bit about networking health. So we're based in Sussex. Um, we're a management consultancy and training service working within the pharmaceutical, medical device and NHS arena. And um, we can help you with a whole host of things, but I'm not going to go through them now. And um, we're on to the next slide. <laughs> So um, a couple of housekeeping things, although I think we might need to sort of actually stick this up to begin with in future. Um, just make sure that you're on mute um, if you've joined us. Um, the session should last for about 45 minutes, so there were a few minutes late getting going, but hopefully that's okay for everyone. If you have any questions, do send them in via the chat function and hopefully we'll have enough time to answer them all. Um, and we are aiming to record this session, so if you don't want to pop up on the screen, then switch your camera off, um, otherwise you might end up in the presentation. Does um, that include me, Mel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that includes you, Mike. <laughs> and then I think we're on to the next slide. So Steve is going to introduce Mike and then it's down to that. Yeah. So I'm very happy again to introduce good friend and colleague Dr. Michael Smith. Um, Mike I've known for a number of years now and when it comes to foreseeing the future he's pretty damn hot. For those of you that joined us in the last uh, webinars around COVID-19, I think Mike predicted the end of Public Health England is nigh. Well, if you've read the papers and you've kept up to date, you'll find out that Mike said that about two weeks before anybody else even admitted it was going to happen. Um, so I said to Mike, what can we do for the next one? It was obvious. You all said, can we have some help on PCN? So, the title is How to Help PCNs Help Themselves. I'm handing over to Dr. Mike Smith, who, those of you who don't know, is incredibly well skilled in this area, as one of his roles is to go around and help set them up. Um, so really, over to you, Mike, and I'll let you explain as you go along more about yourself. Um, and let's all enjoy the next half an hour. Take care. Okay. But thanks very much. Steve. That's a very kind introduction. I, I am going to try and do this without the headset so that I, it just feels more natural. I'm also going to do it standing up because I hate sitting down at a desk. Otherwise, I just feel like one of those gamers who post tubes to YouTube on Minecraft. And I, I feel like I'm, I, I don't want to go into that pigeonhole. But if you have any problem hearing what I'm saying, please do just uh, unpause, put your hand up, type a message, whatever. Uh, I'm going to go at a bit of a rate of not because actually there's so much to say uh, about primary care networks. Just to give you a little bit more background on myself, yes, I am a GP by trade. I'm a practicing GP. I've been a doctor for over 20 years, uh, um, but I have worked across all sectors. I've been a medical director of a large acute teaching trust. They're all free. I've been the director of integrated care. I've overseen the, ma the merger of hospitals. I've developed integrated health systems. I've worked for the Greater Manchester uh, and also the uh, Ma Manchester Devolution. Uh, I really do have experience in most sectors. And, and when Steve says I can see the future, I just spot patterns. And as you know, when you've been in an industry long enough and you see patterns, you, you get good at spotting them. So it's not that I've got some sort of tea leaves uh, and I can see the future. I genuinely, people are predictable, systems are predictable. And you know, those of you who have been in this system long enough will know that we're just seeing stuff that we're just, we're sort of 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, just coming full cycle. I mean. Chinese blessings and the interesting thing about the three Chinese blessings is they're also curses as well and uh, I, I, if someone had said to me may you live in interesting times may you be recognized by people in high places may you find what you're looking for uh, unfortunately I'm, I feel that I am interest, living in interesting times I am getting recognized by people in high places mostly because of my contrary beliefs uh, and I am getting close to finding what I'm looking for uh, but more on that later but look, we are in interesting times. I, 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 I'm sure you see it. I'm sure everyone who works at it, and certainly in health, we've never seen the likes of it. 
Um, so what I'm going to do today, I'm not, I could spend hours talking about PCNs. And in fact, I could run a whole series of, of training about how to engage them, with, how they run, going into detail about the contract. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to briefly have an overview of what a primary care network is and how it fits in the NHS landscape. I'm also going to tell you about what they've been doing, which quite frankly isn't very much, but also what they're going to be doing in the future. Then I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the opportunity. And then I'm going to basically, uh, and it's not a slide, I want to talk to you about what I think are the, uh, the best tips to work with, certainly primary care. And that's going to become more of a fading term over the years, because what's clear is that community care and primary care are going to find themselves in the out of hospital care setting. And I think that you know, we've been saying those words for years, but actually contractually it's looking more and more like that. So what are PCNs? Now, look, I don't need to tell you, because I, 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 uh, uh, a lot of you will know, but I'm just going to give you a bit of background. This is the official NHS England slide on primary care networks. And if you ask most GPs to recount what a PCN is, they will tell you nothing like this. Because what NHS England believe PCNs are and what GPs believe PCNs are are very different. But it's important to know where they're coming from. So NHS England believe primary care networks are a way of devolving healthcare to, to local neighbourhoods, local wards, local areas of population. And they've determined, based on a model that was based on rats, no, I kid you not, based on rats, that the best population for to be serving to help everything to get the economies of scale that you need, both in terms of staffing, equipment, etc., but also the localism you need for multidisciplinary teams, is a population of around 30 to 50,000 patients. And what they envisaged is a, a comprising groups of clinicians sharing a vision about how to improve care, blah, 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 blah. You know, the stuff you hear from policy all the time. It's admirable. I don't have any criticism with it whatsoever, but it's not very, it doesn't make you go, whoa, no one, I've never heard that in a talk before. If you ask a GP what they think a primary care network is, a primary care network is a lifeline of new staff, new facilities, and new funds to come through. But as it, become, as it unfolds, we're becoming that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Primary care networks, just to give you an idea about some of them, is that they're, they're interesting because although you'll have a group of GP practices, very rarely have they registered as a business. So I, I'm in a primary care network called Abbey Health, and Abbey Health is just a name. Abbey Health is not even a registered business. It is a registered authority in terms of, uh, as far as NHS contracting goes, but there's no uh, shareholders of Abbey Health. There's no uh, entity that's registered at Company's House. It's just a collaboration of practices. And most of the time, there'll be one practice is what they call the lead contractor. And one practice that employs the staff on behalf of the other staff. One practice that uh, reviews the governance on behalf of the other staff. Now, usually they have a clinical director and 90% of the time, this clinical director is a general practitioner. There are some instances around the country of nurses and particularly pharmacists becoming clinical directors. But what's interesting about them is that they can employ their own staff. And sometimes that can be via an SLA through the main practice, but they will have staff who, and we indeed we do, who say that they work for the PCN. They're, they're, they're identifying as rather than working for a practice, working for a primary care network. And they can hold a contract. In fact, they do hold a contract. They can hold uh, uh, existing contracts that are available via the uh, NHS England. But there are instances around the country, particularly the Northeast, of primary care networks as being subcontracted either by acute trusts or by hospital, uh, sorry, or by community hospitals or community trusts, or sometimes by a private provider. They can also uh, give out contracts. So there are instances of primary care networks outsourcing to private companies, Babylon, Ada, these sort of private GP companies to provide some, uh, some degree of, uh, sorry, some business. Now, they nearly all have a name. Yeah, they, in fact, they have to. But what most people have been concentrating for the last year while they've been setting up is largely some of the le you know, least deliverable stuff in terms of patient care and more some of the sort of practical stuff in terms of names, letterhead, logos. If you want to get a bunch of GPs excited, get them to come up with a name and a logo. Really, it's, it's, it's as close to the apprentice as they can be, to be honest. And, 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 and unfortunately, most have not progressed much further. Yes, some people have got some great ideas, but as is always the case when people are time poor, 
the person to take it up and actually do something is very rarely there. And there are only a handful of PCNs that are actually in any way doing anything at the moment. They will do, but it's early days yet. The only thing they have to have in terms of NHS England is something called a network agreement. And that essentially is just a, it's almost like a partnership agreement between the practices about how they're going to behave. But here's the really interesting thing. You nearly always cannot kick a practice out of your PCN. You have to get NHS England's express permission to do so. So once you're in, they're in for life. I mean, they have to do something pretty bad if, you, if they're going to be in. So it's really interesting uh, uh, in terms of when you're considering that there were 50 GP practices that went bust last year in, the, in England, in England, not the UK. What would you feel if you were a practice who had another practice that was going bust in your PCN? Now, the answer is they would expect the PCN to take over the practice. <clears throat> but I'm giving you a clue there of what I think the real reason behind PCNs is. So where do they sit in the system? Now, once again, this is NHS England slide. And I think what's really interesting here is that I think it was to sort of not get people scared because what they didn't do was get rid of anyone in this <coughs> uh, diagram. So what they've said is that there's this integrated care system, which is where you have social uh, <coughs> council, you have um, <coughs> the local commissioners, you have um, people from you have a sip of tea. No, it's gone. Uh, it, it, where you have local commissioners, where you have the council, you have uh, LMCs, you have uh, local, uh, uh, some of the local health uh, figures. Then you've got an at-scale primary provider. These are your federations. Then you have your PCNs that sit below these. And then you have the practice and then you have the person. Now, I fully believe that that was to keep everyone calm when they came out. I do not believe that the federations and the at-scale primary care providers have a future. There's fewer and fewer contracts going through them. They're having the one, the one contract that most of them have is gonna be taken away from them soon. I also believe that we're seeing the beginning of the end of the individual practices. I, I, I'll tell you why that is in a moment. And I've got some very good evidence to it. And the reason why that's important to you is that it'll tell you where you, you need to concentrate your activities. Because I believe that these primary care networks are going to essentially take the place of a lot of the functions of CCGs. Now, this is a, an interesting one, and I, I don't know if I should be showing this to you, but this is uh, based on 16,000 GP practices in 2010. And this was basically the average income breakdown of a GP practice and where they get their money. And I don't need to worry so much about the amounts because that's a capitated amount per patient. Uh, and from this, you've got to pay your doctors, you've got to pay your staff, you've got to pay your rates, you've got to pay everything. But I think the thing I want to tell you about is, is just how funding is changed and why that makes PCNs even more important going forward. Now, this big blue thing you can see here is the global sum. Now, that is your, uh, basically your core contract. That's, that's what I get contracted and that's the price I get paid per patient. In fact, in St. Albans, I get paid slightly less than that because they're more affluent. Per patient, per year, to provide five-day-a-week care, Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. till 6.30 p.m. and you know, all the care that you'd expect from your GP practice, yeah? Now that makes up about 60% of my income. based around people's health and you get paid an achievement on how many patients with diabetes, blood pressure you kept to below a certain area, etc. This purple bit, this directly enhanced service bit is possibly the most important bit because that is what they call the directly enhanced service. And that's the optional contract, bits of contract that practices can opt in and out of. And this currently includes things like minor surgery, things like having a patient participation group, uh, but recently, they've put the primary care networks contract in there. Now, locally enhanced services are things that the contracts the CCG might want to uh, do. And other is things like private income. When I do an insurance medical, uh, some, uh, some people uh, get payments for being a GP for more than 20 years, but they phase that out. Now, the reason I'm showing this to you is I've got one from 2022 of how it's going to look. Now, this is slight, I've, I've changed the graph sometimes, it's just so you can compare and contrast. If you look at that blue line, that's the core contract, the global sum. And you can see as a percentage of how much income it makes up, 
it makes up now 75% of our income. So when you hear in the media about uh, GP funding's increasing, that's largely because they've increased the amount going in the, in the global sum. Okay? Now, she really is. Um, when you hear about, uh, sorry, you can see that the MPIG, this uh, red, uh, orange uh, bit, disappeared altogether. Quoth has shrunk massively. The bit that's grown uh, not as much as global sum is the DES, the, the, the primary care network bit. And there's private works going to next to nothing and the locally commissioned service work is going to nothing. Now of 2022, Quoth, the DES and the LES or the LCSs, will all be in the primary care networks. Now, you may think, why am, why am I telling you this? Some of you have worked out already. What I'm trying to tell you is, just under a quarter of a practice's income will be channeled through the primary care network. Now, a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, that's no big deal. That would make us fall over. And what this has meant is, is that rather than the primary care network being something that supports the practice, by 2022, the practice will be supporting the PCN. And we, although it's optional, we won't be able to function as a business without it. And then my suspicion, and I guarantee that this, I, I can't confirm this, but I, I'm pretty damn sure, is by 2024, at the end of the five-year contract, I reckon they're going to put the global sum through the primary care networks. And there, that will signal the death of individual practices. I, I, can't, I, I can't see why they wouldn't do that. If I was a, uh, an a, NHS England, I, I would want, it would make perfect sense for me to do that. But that's why the future of general practice and primary care is in PCNs. Now, what they, NHS England said in 2019, what we want to do is stabilize the GP partnership model. Now, I think it's an interesting word, choice of words. Not modernize, not uh, maintain, stabilize. I think that's really interesting. The other thing is they, they say they're not going to put any more money through individual practices. They want it to go to PCNs in the form of staffing rather than money. And that's because they learned their lesson the last time the GPs got a pay rise because all the GPs did was go out and buy lots of new cars. They were called quaff cars. Everyone had them. But they're not going to fall for that mistake again. They also, this is NHS England's word, want it to be a platform for how funds get into local systems. Now that means prescribing, that means local commissioning decisions on certain treatments in areas of need. This means effectively that instead of going to the CCG, they're going to be going to the PCNs for them to work. And what this means is that it, it, will, it will divide, uh, sorry, it will dissolve the current divide between primary and community services. And I believe they, they actually want that to not to dissolve, they want that to disappear. They want it to be known as out of hospital care. And this is the bit that I find most interesting. The NHS England said, we want to reduce the demand on A&E, reduce NHS spend and improve patient experience. So that's really, it's the same old story of what they need to do. But, you know, there's no surprises there. But it tells you a lot of where the future of this is going. And remember, they've only given us the plans up until 2022. They, they can change, in 20, next year, it'll change again. The changes of what they said they were going to do when they announced them in 2017 to now, has been profound. So what do I read into that? Well, just to summarize again what I read into that, I think the individual practices are dead, absolutely dead. I mean, I, I, I can't see why anyone should be thinking in practices anymore. I think it's gonna mean the demise of clinical commissioning groups. Uh, I've said that, that last time and this time, but it does mean that individual clinical uh, uh, primary care networks will have budgets to spend on smaller business units. Now, what essentially this is going to mean is that, is that they'll want to get more services out of the hospital, out of the hospital and into the community, into primary care. And remember, the community, there, are, there are only 17 community trusts left at the moment. And so there's not much, there's not much opportunity for, for that to, get any, to, to, to go anywhere other than primary care and their estates. And what this means for primary care is a massive period of uncertainty for people. And what that also means is a massive period of opportunity for the right-minded people, both primary care and those people who, who, uh, who uh, operate within it and around it. Now, just to give you a brief summary, all that's been announced in the original primary care network contract is five elements. 
care homes and, and proactive management of elderly people in care homes, structured medication reviews, particularly focusing on those with chronic disease, those with complex medical conditions, and those with what they call polypharmacy, which they classify as being on six or more medications. They want us to make a drive on early cancer diagnosis in all its forms. Extended hours is, is more of a sort of a, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. That's something that's already happening that was in that purple bit of the pie chart that they've just moved in. And social prescribing is something they've just tacked on the end. There's no funding associated to it. We, 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 we don't have a definite, we're pretty sure though, that the following year they're going to add stuff around cardiovascular disease prevention and also something about reducing health inequalities. So looking at at risk at need groups in your area and how you're going to uh, balance healthcare for them. Now this is th things that I can see that looking into particular is things such as sexual health because access to sexual health services is dramatically declined as public health funding and also uh, the commissioning of it's dried up. So our patients now have to travel 21 miles for their local sexual health service uh, uh, to, to, to see somebody. And I see other things that that will involve, such as uh, it'll be bundled up into the cardiovascular disease, things such as so smoking cessation. Uh, it'll be stuff around weight management. It'll be stuff about graded exercise. It'll be stuff around patient education. Now, what I can tell you is that there's only a modest amount of payment associated for delivering this service, yeah? So I, the, the numbers are not gonna make me go out and buy a Maserati in this contract. What is absolutely eye-watering is, is they've got this thing called the Additional Roles Reimbursement Scheme, which is bundled into the contract, which attracts at the moment, and I say at the moment, because it increases every year, an average of 1.13 million per year per PCN. So 30 to 50,000 people will get over a million quid to spend on staff, some will get more, and that's over 2.4 billion nationally. And as I said to you earlier, more and more of the DES will go via to PCNs, the lesers will, and I'm utterly convinced that the core contract will eventually. So those practices and those people who support those practices and the industry around it, who can see this tide, are going to have an advantage. Because if you're, it, 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 the way it works in general practice is that the first people do it and a few people get fear of missing out, a load more get fear of missing out, and before you know it, everybody's doing it. And I, 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 I'm telling you, any practice that I'm involved with, any practice I'm in, I will be, I, it will be the hill that I die on that your core contract is at risk. Now, just to remind you once again, look at it now. I'm saying a quarter of that circle will go to PCNs next year. The other three quarters will go in three years' time. Now, the other thing that I think is interesting is that they keep on adding to the, to the nature of the roles that one can employ in these PCNs. What's really interesting about there, there's no doctors. Yeah? Another interesting thing, there's no nurses. So they're clearly realizing that there are no doctors and nurses in primary care. So rather than make false promises of being able to recruit them, they're encouraging people to raid the pot of other healthcare professionals. Now, some of these roles, I didn't know what they were um, before, before, before this came out. I didn't quite know what a health coach was. Uh, I didn't quite... Uh, a nurse who's very uh, good at organizing stuff and being a manager, you could uh, employ her as a care coordinator as long as she doesn't work or he doesn't work clinically. Now, once again, this is changing all the time. And, you know, the, the, my worry here is that there is going to be a massive pot raided that there's not enough to go around. So, look, let me tell you, how, how do you think GPs are rising to the challenge? Yeah. So, GPs, I can tell you how they rose to the challenge. It was an absolute Muppet show. Everyone has been clambering, it's too much, we can't recruit, there's too much information here, you've given us no money for management, how the heck are we supposed to affect a &E attendances, how on earth are we supposed to make uh, um, uh, care coordinator roles relevant? It's been absolute chaos, and like I said, there's not many people who have done much with this. Really, they will do, but with, the, with COVID uh, coming, uh, coming as well, it's really, really put a, a, a break on it. 
But then you think, okay, are they up for it? Are they feeling okay? Is this, is, do they really see this as the future? Well, maybe they did last year, but we're feeling pretty knackered at the moment. We are feeling totally laid back and totally just wanting someone to do it for us. And you think I'm, you, I'm not just saying that how I feel. The Doctors Association did a poll last month, last month, and they surveyed 10,000 GPs, and 80% of them said, that they were more likely now to leave the NHS because of the whole handling of this pandemic and how they'd felt undervalued and overexposed. And they do not trust NHS England and they, all they want to do is find a way to make life easy as possible for themselves while they recover from something that's been bloody tough. But that's an opportunity. So the opportunities, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to, I, I, I want to do some questions at the end, I really do. There's loads more, there's loads more. And the thing I love and the reason Despite working for Ernst and Young in the past, despite working with PwC in the past, despite being offered all sorts, the reason I like working with Steve and the reason I've agreed to, uh, or wanted, asked to be an associate here, is that I know that actually I don't want to create a menu of stuff where it's we only do this, because I have I've got a broad enough understanding of the clinical side of the system, and Mel and Steve have got an underside of, of of industry. I believe if we don't know, we have access to somebody who does know. But let me tell you where I see the immediate opportunities are with regards to primary care networks. First of all, there's recruitment, clinical services, structural medicine. Let me just go, give you a little bit on these. So it's been nationally reported that GPs are finding it so hard to recruit to roles. I told you that there'd been two billion pounds, 2.4 billion pounds assigned to these new roles. Do you know that 1.8 billion of that has not been spent in the first year? They've had an underspend of it. And that's not because we don't want it, but it's because trying to find someone with an organization that doesn't have the support to mentor somebody, doesn't have the uh, uh, management to sort of design a service to get, to get a clinical person in and take them in has been tough. There's also not access to them uniformly around the UK. In Hertfordshire, we have real problems accessing pharmacists. In Sussex, they can't access paramedics. And that's because of just of where training facilities are, where the, what the local ambulance, what the local pharmacies are doing. And I can give you stories all around the country. Surrey Heartlands has the biggest underspend on, 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 um, on additional roles in the UK. Hertfordshire has the second biggest underspend. Hearts Valley is the, is the CCG with the, with the biggest underspend in the country. Um, industry, uh, I believe, has an opportunity to help with this. They have access to a range of non-clinical and clinical staff. When I worked with Coloplast in, in the past, I was stunned about how much uh, additional uh, staff, uh, nursing staff they provided to my practice. And, I, and it was just such an easy, easy win for us. And I'm not suggesting for one minute that you know, every PCN in the country needs a, 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 color, a, sorry, a stoma nurse. But actually, when you think about it, I'm between all of you and between all the people you know, you will have access to healthcare professionals that I and my colleagues don't. You also have the unique ability to broker arrangements between the sectors because a big fear of PCNs is because they're not businesses, there is a lot of liability in taking on staff. So if you are a PCN that doesn't have much income and you're not quite sure about the future and the contract's only for four years, you probably don't have the uh, in uh, clinical, sorry, the uh, management nows to find a contract that puts you at low risk and means that the person is supported in terms of CPD, etc. I know the industry has sponsored roles in the past, and I also know that you you are very good at connecting all of your uh, areas of work around the, around the UK because there's a disconnect clinically around the UK, and you'd have an ability to connect areas of high and local recruitment. I think this is the one that excites me the most because, and I put it second because I didn't want to talk about it forever and not talk about the first, but new clinical services. And I can, I can tell you now that PCNs will have to, have to provide services that are outside NHS England's DES, be that NHS or be that privately. But PCNs do not have the capacity, imagination or skill to write business cases or even just dream of the art of the possible. And in my, in my dabbling with this, in connecting some of the people Steve's introduced me to, to some of the PCNs, there's been acorns growing into oak trees. And I really believe that if you connect the right people 
with the right uh, with the right service it's it happens look it's gonna you'll need the forward thinking pcns to be thinking with the forward thinking uh hospitals and community clinics and the forward thinking industry but those three are connected you really can start a movement here and i can tell you different pcns will have different priorities and it might be clinical priorities it might be that the cd is just not interested in that service for instance i am very interested as a cd uh, for my pcn in dermatology in musculoskeletal medicine i'm less interested in gynae and sexual health and, it, it, and unfortunately most gps are the same as me so i'm more likely to speak to a sector of something i'm interested in and once again, that's just about finding the priorities and finding the interests and connecting them. And I think network, Networking Health has the opportunity to be that dating service. And as I said to Steve, my dream would be to have a load of clinical services in a, in a, in a catalogue and basically passing them to the PCNs when I go and speak to them nationally at the BMA or be it to uh, NAPC or whatever and saying, look, which one of these services do you think would look cool at your PCN? And then going that one. And Steve and I are saying, let's connect you. Let's sort this up. We'll have a blueprint. We've done it before in here. Let me introduce you to the people who are already doing it over in wherever. And that's the way we need to be. And that's the way it's worked before. Now, once again, the, um, the, the, the other, the other opportunity is research. I'm not going to, I'm running out of time, but I'm just, I don't need to tell you guys about the opportunity research. You've got bigger populations. You've got data sharing procedures in place. It's a relatively easy, low work source of income for PCNs. And you could help contribute to helping with the re recruitment problem if you have a sort of a, a half research person and a half clinical person that you somehow punch something together. Localism is really appealing for research, particularly around certain conditions. Now, this is the final thing I say about opportunity, but there are much, much more. Look, GPO education is drawn to a standstill. I'm the, I'm one of the education leads at my practice, and to define a teaching program for my staff is daunting. For a PCN, I don't have the time, and I'm a clever enthusiastic guy if you don't mind me saying i believe that industry could have a, a could have a, a role here in setting up education programs structured education programs for pcns to deliver to gp practices in an innovative post-covid world and there are all ways of teaching rather than getting a consultant to put a usb drive into a, a stick into a, a computer presenting a load of slides providing crisps and leaving it needs to be better than that you need to link into GPs appraisals. You need to link into their CPD. You need to link into a, a, maybe a three or four topics. And the, the opportunities to do that is now. It's exciting. And once again, education is one of my other passions. And once again, I, I'm gonna finish now just saying, look, I, I, Stephen uh, and Mel have been really good about not overselling networking health. I think it's gonna be one of the more exciting things that I've done in a decade. Really, I, 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 I'm so excited to be working with them because actually they're the first couple I've met that just aren't scared to give anything a go. So if anything I've said has made you think, oh, they've got a couple of an acorn of an idea there, I'd just like, just talk to us, talk to me. I'm enthusiastic, they're enthusiastic. And the one thing I'll say is if I can't do it or I think it's a crap idea, I will tell you. I, I'm, unfortunately, that's just the way it is with me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just open it up for a question, but one thing I will do before I just switch the camera back to me, if I can work out how to do it. Um, what have I done there? Right now, is a bad time to start cold calling people. Really, I, I, I'm sure you all know that. So even I am being very careful about how I'm going to, um, how I'm going to communicate with the, this with people. The second thing is, uh, and, and once again, I, you just have to excuse me because I, my GP colleagues wouldn't be overly happily, happy me saying this, but GPs we think we're special, doctors we think we're special. I know we're not, um, and that's, a lot of my mates aren't doctors and that's why because I find doctors a bit irritating a lot of the time. But the problem with doctors is that we think we're wizards and we think the rest of the world are muggles. And unfortunately, doctors find it much easier to hear stuff from other doctors. And I'm not saying networking health, but if you want access to them, it's always better to get what they call a clinical to clinical conversation. David Sloman, chief executive of the Royal Free, now at NHS England, he told me that 15 years ago. Uh, and, and it's the best advice I've ever had. Third thing is, a GP's priority is to reduce their workload. Yeah? 
because workload is through the roof. So if you say anything that reduces somebody's work, you'll, they'll be all ears. A GP's se uh, uh, next priority, this is point number four, is something that's gonna help them with their workforce. We have a real problem with uh, clinical staff at the moment. Even at my practice, we are understaffed clinically. There is, we're all fishing from a very small pot. If we can think of something to help that burden. And the fifth thing is, and they won't say it, is we're all a bit petrified about income because income is falling. We made a 25% reduction in profit last year in our practice and COVID's gonna hit that again. So if you can, find, if, if you can think of though that matrix of how to appeal to people, that's the way to approach it. Right, I've, I'm gonna look in the chat, see if there are any questions, uh, but Mel, you better sort of field yeah. them because I... Um, Mike, the first question that came in was from Alex, uh, and it was, can you broaden the social prescribing? I take it that's maybe around what that actually meant on your side. So, so that's a really, really good question. And the short answer is that social prescribing, um, if you go to different parts of the country, everybody's doing it differently. And I've, I've tried to ask that question, what is the, uh, what, what is the uh, ultimate social prescribing model? And the, the best model I can find, I won't go into detail now, is a guy in South London called Mo Sikaram, S-E-K-O-R-A-M. Uh, -E now he's basically the Royal College of GPs prescribing lead. And he's got this, he's doing amazing things in Merton, it's Merton, uh, around social prescribing. And for him, that's around looking at the non-medical determinants of people's healthcare. And now he works in quite a deprived area where the impact can be quite high. The other person who does it quite well is Sam Everington and Bromley by Bo. And the, the, the idea is, is that if I can help somebody manage their finances, if I can help somebody become less bored that they, they don't have to go to the day if i can find a way to make exercise fun for somebody why can't i plug uh, my community into these people who do this as current as a current service now once again it's not an expensive signposting service so, uh, signposting service some people look at it as because uh, you know that would just be a complete waste of time what it is is looking at someone's needs fit, formulating in their heads making sure it's a non-clinical need and then actively signposting them to that resource in the community. It shouldn't involve any other funds, to be honest. Alex, Alex is that a thumbs up from you, that answer? Yeah? Yeah, Alex, <laughs> Alex is, is grinning. Bro. And the next question, Mike, is from Pete, uh, and that's how are you finding networking with other PCNs? Um, but I'll actually tie it in with the question from Marion, because it's along similar lines which is, um, do PCNs communicate amongst themselves, uh, or, uh, amongst themselves within areas? Uh, and if there was a project initiati initiated sorry, with a trailblazer PCN, would that be shared with the intention of cascading across an STP or an ICS? So it's really I, about, yeah, how yeah. PCNs are working. I, I, and I, I, wanna, I think it's a really good question, the pair of you. I, I, um, the short answer is, is that there are but when I go and look at them, they're not as successful as people, as, as I've been led to believe. And, and, and one of my good colleagues, Steve Kell, who's a GP in um, the Northeast, uh, really wonderful guy, really wise GP. Um, I said to him, what's the biggest mistake in your, you've made in your career? He said, well, it's when, I, it's when the King's Fund asked to look at my practice as an exemplar, as a trailblazer. And I said, why? And he said, well, as soon as we did it, he said, things started doing that. He said, and then we found ourselves with 20 people visiting a week. I couldn't lead the PCN. And he said, in the end, we just weren't a trailblazer anymore. So it's back to my Chinese curse about may you come to the attention of people in authority. I think there is, but I, I think for me, I think those projects are slightly dated in terms of cascading them in trailblazing, pathfinder and stuff. I believe the power of this lies in influencing social media, um, you know, let me give you a prime example of that, that the general practice COVID response around the country was not done through internet groups, which NHS England had set up. It wasn't done through um, cascading uh, list server emails that LMCs were doing. We shared documents, we shared ideas, we bounced off plans off each other as a group of leading GPs in the country on Twitter and on Facebook. And our plans got carved up and carved up and spat back to us and we liked them and we shared them again. So I believe that uh, they do communicate amongst themselves, but not through the channels that you'd have believe. 
So the point is, is that if you, got, if, you know, if you ask any sort of social media user, general practitioner, who would you say the Trailblazer GP influencers are? They'd probably give you a list of about 10 or 11 of them, and they would be the ones who are achieving stuff. So, uh, you know, once again, I'm, 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 I promise I'm not being arrogant, but I am probably one of those people. And I get contacted on social media probably five or six times a day with people asking me questions, Mike, how would I do this? How would I do that? But the benefit is, is that sometimes when I have a question, I can go to them and say, hey, wait a minute, I, I know you were doing this, but how did you do that? And what this means is that when we eventually do meet, which hasn't happened this year, at the national conferences, etc., we sometimes hire our own breakout room and have our own mini conference. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been quite an exciting shift from the traditional channels. You know, don't ask the average GP what they think of the NHS England webinars because they're just, they haven't been very educational. We've had, we're having lots of unofficial ones as well. The only other, the only exception to that is a guy called, I don't know his real name, he's called Dr. Gandalf. Uh, and he runs, he's on social media and he runs video uh, casts where about sharing best practice, etc. cetera. Um, but I think the traditional channels have changed. So, uh, you know, uh, PCC, uh, uh, NHS networks, all that stuff, they're, they're sort of a good decade out of date now. Okay. Fab, I think we're just on one final question before we sort of just summarise and finish uh, from Marion, and that is what is the funding for the shift to this new world of virtual healthcare and how does the Digital Transformation Fund work? Can you answer that one? So I, 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 the, the, I think where is the funding coming from? Well, there's actually the, the, even today there was a, an announcement there's going to be a new GP contract uh, available for digital providers of healthcare. Um, there's, it's, 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 um, it's a new contract called an APMS. I mean, APMS has existed before, but APMS stands for any provider medical services. And uh, they, they have announced 20 areas where they're going to put up, they're going to go out to tender to provide GP serv uh, digital services in under doctored areas. Um, so, you know, areas such as Brighton is, a, is one where that's going to go out to tender because they're, they're, loads of practices have been shutting there. Um, where's the other place? But in Kent etc now once again that's all to preparate that where's the money coming from well it's coming from the gp practices that are closing uh, and I, I i think what we're going to see is i know that a lot of gps have been doing lots of virtual and online healthcare. i think nhs england doesn't want that i think they want to have two options for general practice virtual real and they, they won't want the two mixing and i think they'll want them communicating and interop interoperate and the reason i say this is that there's a company called livy l-i-v-i that's just secured a contract in uh, the Midlands to provide um, uh, 20,000 GP appointments a year for all practices for those who can't get um, uh, an access uh, access to their GP and that, that, that's I don't know why my, my colleagues haven't seen that as the biggest bl uh, siren of warning for them because actually that that's where it's gonna come and and I, I believe that what we're actually gonna see is Digital and virtual healthcare and PCNs, that's where I think it's going. Fabulous. Well, that's all the questions for now. So, yeah. um, well, we're back again. Mike, thank you very much indeed. Um,